Harding's Last Days in Alaska, An Intimate Story of the Late President's Historic Journey, by Joe Mitchell Chapel, McClure's Magazine, November 1923. Our return from the farthest north of the Alaskan trip with President Harding marked the beginning of a definite impression on us all. At first, the trip had brought a succession of surprises, some disappointing, others revising previous estimates, but gradually crystallizing the dominant conclusion that, altogether, Alaska is the greatest treasure of Uncle Sam, that is, outside the borders of the states. In the rush and whirl of the trip, there was evident a pessimistic feeling among some of the party concerning the future of Alaska. But through it all, I found myself an inveterate optimist, for I saw the gold pouring from the pans, the millions of fish in Alaskan waters, the timber covering thousands of square miles, the fertile and producing fields of grain and vegetables, the trainloads of copper ore, the herds of reindeer, the pigs and cows, the railways and highways, the evidences of oil, the great outcropping seams of coal, the small progressive cities, but best of all, I felt the spirit reflecting the hope and determination of the American pioneer. That one billion and a quarter dollars worth of products have been taken out of Alaska in 50 years, with one lone individual for each 20 square miles, is in itself a startling fact. But the sight of all these things was conclusive evidence to confirm my conviction. Alaska looms up before me as the alluring land of isolation and measureless opportunity and adventure. With the coming of rigid dirigible airships of the type of the ZRs, with the extension of airplane service, railroads, and radio, and finally, with more government steamships on the Alaska route, I can vision the possibility of thousands of young men and women coming here to better their conditions and to make permanent homes. I have viewed the Alps in Switzerland, the fjords of Norway, the charm of the Italian lakes, the highlands of Scotland, the picturesque Rhine, the mysterious beauty of the Black Forest, all those magnificent magnets of European natural beauty that draw thousands of American tourists. But all their splendors are filmy shadows compared with the imperial, solitary, and superlative wonders of Alaska. The tourist tide soon will turn to Alaska for scenic sensations that run the gamut of emotions. There is the sail on the greatest inland route of the Seven Seas, the land of the totem pole traditions, the greatest fishing waters of the oceans, the great glaciers that fascinated Muir, the myriad waterfalls amid snow-capped mountains, many yet unnamed, and above all, the imperial Mount McKinley, the transcendent pearl-like peak, a gem supreme among Alaska's landscape jewels. There are vast expanses where the foot of man never trod, where one feels the thrill of discovery. Climates ranging from the equator's scorching sun to the chill of the North Pole. Vegetation from luxuriant jungles to the brilliant flowers garlanding the brows of towering ranges. It is a land of vigorous, self-reliant men and women. This is the land to which the lure of gold will ever call the adventurer. The land which will supply the furs for woman's glory and man's comfort. Alaska's ranges could graze 10 million reindeer to supplement our diminishing meat supply. Her endless forests are a reserve for the future supply of wood pulp that will give us paper and make us independent of foreign sources. A flotilla of automobiles convoyed the presidential train for some miles as we left Fairbanks, making good time along the dusty roads. In all the 300 million acres of land in Alaska, we learned that there are only about 400 miles of motor roads. At Healy, where great seams of coal are visible from the railroad in the cliffs along the river, we stopped to take water. We found almost every man in the group at the station posted on the prices of coal. At the mine, lump coal brings $4, nut $3.50, run of mine $3, screenings $2.50. The rate per ton from the mine to Fairbanks is $1.50, Anchorage $2.50, Seward $3.50, and coal represents a substantial proportion of the tonnage on the government railroad at this time. 
The special train was divided into two sections. In order that Secretary Work might hold meetings in Anchorage, Secretary Hoover in Nenana, while Secretary Wallace was bouncing by motor over the Richardson Trail to join the party again at Valdez. We arrived at Anchorage in early evening. This young city is already the railroad center of Alaska. The shops and executive headquarters located here are as trim and neat as those of long-established railroads. The United States government has invested 57 millions in the Alaskan Railroad, the main line covering a greater distance than from Washington to Boston. It can now be covered by tourists in one day's journey. With 11 coaches, old 618 was not equal to one mountain grade along the route. She stalled in a tunnel, but the young engineer was equal to the emergency. He backed down and left six cars on the trestle, pulled five cars through to a siding, and then went back for the rest of the party. The train whistled for Seward, sweeping by the Great Wireless Station and Seward Dairy Farms, where the grazing cows were blanketed as a protection from mosquitoes. When we left the Pullman, my porter, George Miller, gathering in his tips and lugging off the trophies of the trip, remarked, Now I'm off for my eight months trapping. Believe me, that's the life. All alone in the mountains, with your traps and no one to listen to but yourself and the dog. It always means a stake of $2,000 in eight or ten months, and I'm not going back to the States until I make a real stake. Unconsciously, he echoed the spirit of many of the single men in Alaska. It was like a real homecoming when we returned to the good ship Henderson, snuggling under the shadows of the great mountains at the Seward Wharf. The band played Hail, Hail, the Gang's All Here as the party marched up the gangplank. While we were absent, the Navy band had given daily concerts, which brought to many of the residents memories of Saturday night in the old hometown. The people opened their homes and entertained all on board ship in hospitable frontier fashion. These were supposed to be the two rest days of the journey, but the president put the finishing touches on his last speeches. Little did we dream of the tragic fate impending. Early in the morning, the president worked steadily at his desk inside his cabin, but about 11 o'clock, he appeared on deck and hailed me. Let's have a walk about town. I need a little air. Off we started down Main Street. The passersby did not at first recognize him as he stood looking into the store windows. He commented casually on what the people were buying in Seward. For a time, he became a carefree tourist, forgetting affairs of state and the burden of responsibility that had been insidiously wearing him down. He seemed to take delight in the trifling observations of a saunter through streets where no throngs gathered to stare where he was just a man like any other, and not the nation's most eminent figure set apart in solitary glory. He lingered at nearly every show window with some comment. As we passed the blacksmith shop, he said reminiscently, The sound of that hammer in Anvil is real music to me, reminds me of Harry Cooper's shop at Caledonia. Walking far back into the residential section at the foot of the mountain, he surveyed the array of little home-like bungalows, characteristic of Alaskan towns. I have fallen in love with these little Alaskan homes. I like those stucco houses with red roofs over yonder. These log bungalows are like the ones we saw in Fairbanks. This is certainly the most beautiful city we have seen in Alaska, he remarked, sweeping the line of the horizon with his walking stick. He had stopped to talk with many children, asking them their names, but now that they recognized him, they ran for their cameras to have his picture took before our house, and then, chatting and laughing, walked back to the boat with him. Some of the party came dashing 50 miles an hour on the 18-mile boulevard leading out of Seward, around the shores of Kenai Lake. Everyone stopped at Methuselah Spring and Root to drink deep of its magic waters. Over the spring was painted the legend, Drink these waters and you will live 1,000 years. In the streams along the road were the salmon in their inland water homes, where they returned to native waters to spawn and to die after battling for four to six years in the salt waters of the deep. Evidence of natural gas and petroleum in Alaska was here furnished in a wayside hut, where picnickers stopped to cook their meals on gas stoves supplied through pipes with natural gas from an oil seepage on the mountainside 100 feet away. 
At 9 o'clock that night, a presidential salute of TNT was fired 10 miles away. The roar echoed and re-echoed from mountain to mountain in the landlocked harbor. In the dawn, the great vessel glided silently through the Harding Gateway, freighted with happy memories of the days at Seward and Resurrection Bay. Out into the chill of the gulf, the floating White House sailed along the glacier-lined shores and among myriads of islands. Some of these islands, containing 10 acres and upward, are leased by the government at $25 per year for fox farm reserves, and fox farmers live here all alone, caring for and feeding the animals that are reared in the open. The fox will not swim ashore. They live high on the fish provided for them, adding a goodly sum to the fur revenue of Alaska. An inland sail of 20 hours in the waters of Prince William Sound brought the Henderson to Valdez, the farthest north winter port of Alaska. On one shore were copper mines, on the opposite, the gold quartz locations. The tide was running, and the big boat could not be landed at the wharf, where many thousands of gold seekers had landed in Klondike days. Valdez is built on a moraine, the land made by giant glaciers that have now retired between two great mountains. This little city in its picturesque setting is one terminus of the Richardson Highway, the automobile route to Fairbanks. In early days, Valdez was the favorite port for a railroad terminal. In fact, many railroad projects involving desperate competition were started from here, but not one of the railroads was ever built. The town boasts a courthouse, and is the headquarters of the judicial district. Like Skagway, it is a community of 500 people, living in high hopes and stirring memories. Everyone is a prospector in Valdez. The jeweler, clerk, banker, ministers, all spend every spare moment with a prospector's outfit somewhere among the mountains. The president drove out to the famous Keystone Canyon on the Richardson Trail, which at the very beginning crosses 27 bridges spanning the rushing gray water of the glacier streams, streams pouring out of the great mass of ice that forms a colorful background to the picture of Valdez, which lay before us. Pulses quickened as the motors climbed up and up along the rim of the mountains. A thousand feet below was a rushing torrent. The motors stopped, and the grandeur of it all made us speechless, as our eyes hungrily feasted on these vistas of Alaska's majesty. Again we were on the Henderson, bound for Cordova through island-dotted channels. Along the Alaska coastline, more extended than that of all the United States by the way, the big naval transport sailed, where crafts as large had never steamed before. Now and then, a solitary lighthouse indicated the charted waters. The lofty mountains stood as if grimly challenging man to unlock their treasures. The copper capital of Alaska is Cordova. The Kennecott mine has no rival in the world for the richness of its copper ore. It runs as high as 70% per copper. One great nugget of copper taken out weighed 1,200 pounds. The Guggenheim interests invested $22 million in the Copper River and Northwestern Railroad in order to develop these mines. The general opinion in Alaska today is that they want more men with large capital and financial courage. The great mineral wealth of Alaska has barely been scratched, and can only be developed with a lavish and even a hazardous outlay of capital. A special train of coaches and dining car awaited at the Cordova Wharf to take us to the Child's Glacier. Here, the glacier chasers among us were to be fully satisfied. The railroad over which we traveled was built in 1910 in a desperate battle against time. The false work of the Million Dollar Copper River Bridge has been erected on the ice, and the ice went out 40 minutes after it had been removed. For this 40-minute leeway, the engineers were indebted to a captain who took a hazardous shortcut through inland channels with his vessel, which was carrying on deck the iron for the bridge work. He delivered it ahead of the deadline schedule and saved the bridge. Alaskan development owes much to the Copper River Railroad, 194 miles in length. It was built to carry ore, but 10% of the road's business is for the Alaskan people, whose interests are given preference even over copper traffic. The Guggenheim's investment of about 22 millions in this line has yielded less than 2%, and for lack of freight, the government's own railroad is still worse off at present. It stands little chance of paying dividends for some years to come. Only 6,000 people now live along the 500 miles of this railroad. 
Alaskans feel that more of the money made in Alaska should be reinvested there to meet the great hazards involved in mining development. Our train swept over miles of swampy lowlands toward Copper River, and when it stopped at the bridge, we saw an imposing procession of icebergs floating down the stream. We walked down the left bank of the river, through a profusion of wild flowers, until across the river, 800 feet away, the famous Child's Glacier loomed into view. It is a solid cliff of ice, 200 feet high, following the shore 15 miles and extending back several miles between the mountain peaks. This glacier's motion is comparatively rapid, and at frequent intervals it throws off into the stream huge pieces of ice weighing tons. They fall with a noise like the crash of guns in a heavy artillery barrage, and hurl water up to a height of 20 to 50 feet. The waves swept on like a rising tide to the opposite bank where we stood. Along the skyline of the glacier were fanciful turrets, towers, and spires of crystal, gleaming in the sunlight in prismatic beauty. The glacier battery had ceased, and the president called Ferguson, one of the secret service men, to his side. Fergie, he said, fire. See if you can hit that glacier wall. Even the shriek of a locomotive whistle will sometimes start glacier ice moving to the waters below. Ferguson fired, and whether it was that shot that caused the barrage of 21 guns or 21 glacier crashes, we do not know. But a president's salute of 21 explosions followed in quick succession, as glistening tons of ice slid down the bank at different places into the river, covering a firing line of nearly a mile. This, by the way, was the only order to fire ever given by President Harding, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. The whistle of the locomotive called us back, and seemed to stir up a parting shot that sounded like the roar of a machine gun battery in action. It is the quantity of natural novelties like the explosive glacier that accounts in part for the annually increasing tourist travel in Alaska. Here is one great undiscovered land for tourist companies. The journey means more to jaded American nerves than a gallop through Europe. The time is not far distant when Alaska will receive annually as many visitors as are now entering the Yellowstone and Yosemite parks every year. High up the hill to the bandstand perched on the side of a mountain at Cordova traveled the members of the cabinet and their wives, in big trucks through a blaze of flags. There was a shortage of pleasure cars in these vertical cities, but they displayed more American flags than I ever saw before in one place. After the concluding ceremonies of the Cordova visit, we set sail again on the Henderson for a three days journey across the Alaskan Gulf to Sitka, ancient Russian capital of Alaska, where in 1867 the official transfer of ownership to the United States was made. The monotony of the trip was broken by a shuffleboard tournament, in which the interest centered on the president's fine playing, which held out until well toward the finals. He was a lover of sport, and played as hard as he worked, always applauding skill and good shots no matter on what side they were made. Although he appeared to be enjoying the game, an observant eye could see that his mind was on his unfinished speeches. In the merriment of that hour, we little thought that this would be the last game that he would ever play. As we traveled east, gaining an hour between Seward and Sitka, the days began to lengthen, and the sheen of the long twilight was dimming, but the icy breath of the Alaskan range still swept the decks. Nearly 200 miles of glacier mountains skirted the picturesque coastline, always within the horizon. Like a phantom ship, the Henderson slipped through the darkness of the narrow channels and anchored in the harbor of Sitka. Here, Russian warships were anchored many years ago to protect their possessions in early days. Days when Sitka was a thriving town, building ships and making plows, picks, and spades for sale in Mexico and California, when Chicago was still only an Indian village, and the country between it and the Pacific coast the undisputed land of the Red Man. The tradition that there are only a few days in a season when it does not rain in Sitka is no longer current. The president's last day in Alaska opened and continued an ideal summer day without a cloud in the sky. The harbor of Sitka is dotted with beautiful islands. The brown rugged peak of Mount Edgecombe lifts itself like a monarch over all. 100 years ago, it was an active volcano. The contour of the surrounding mountains was rounded, less somber or jagged and stern than their brother and sister peaks of the north. They appeared more friendly. 
the curved skyline seemed to extend a kindly welcome. A well-defined cross of snow gleams eternal on a distant mountain. On the site of the castle of Baranov, who for 40 years ruled Alaska under the Russian regime, now stands a United States government house, occupied by Dr. Georgeson, in charge of agricultural work during the past 25 years. Surrounded by a velvety lawn, rich shrubbery of flowering currants, and gardens fairly gleaming with poppies, the building commands a beautiful sweep of town and harbor. The bells in the old Russian church, under the green mosque-like dome, were ringing a welcome as we landed. This old capital town of Alaska is redolent with stories of the days of Russian occupation. The picturesque wharves have a touch of Old World solidity, and all the charm of northern New England coast towns. Landing in launches, the presidential party was greeted on the village green, located near the site of the old prison and custom house, the frame of which has withstood the ravages of weather and time for over a hundred years. As distinct from the new towns of the north, all here had historic settings, harking back to the scenes of Russian conferences with hostile Indians, arranging to smoke the pipe of peace. Representatives of Sitka's modern Chamber of Commerce and Postmaster Darman, who also is Collector of Customs, were on hand to tell of Sitka's hot springs and its advantage as the ideal summer and winter resort of the North. Children and adults alike, some of them descendants of the early Russian settlers and the hostile Indians, brought flowers and strode them in the President's pathway. There was something akin to spiritual benediction in the address of the President on that Sunday. It reflected a missionary spirit of goodwill and a stand for righteousness. The little girls had made cookies which they served with plates of salmon berries of every hue. The president and Mrs. Harding enjoyed them and complimented the little girls as prize American cooks. When Mrs. Harding asked the girls to sing, they responded with one verse of Alaska My Alaska. Sitka was a golden dream picture that Sunday. While the church bells were ringing, the President and Mrs. Harding unexpectedly entered the little brown church of the natives, connected with the Sheldon Jackson mission, for the regular services. Little bobbed-haired Indian girls in white blouses occupied the front pews, and could not resist looking back at the presidential party in the fourth pew. How their fresh young voices rang out as they sang with the President and Mrs. Harding the opening hymn, Holy Holy Lord God Almighty. That little mission church in Sitka is now memorable as the last church in which President Harding attended divine services. Close at hand is the Sheldon Jackson Museum, filled with interesting Alaskan relics. One which interested the president particularly was an effigy of an Eskimo wearing an ivory tusk piercing the upper lip, a mark of distinction. We saw still other relics when we were guided down the witching Lover's Lane, a model park drive through a hemlock and spruce forest, toned in the rich brown of the undergrowth. Along the drive were towering totem poles, aglow with grim figures chronicling traditions of Indian family history. On some of the poles, there was the face of a man wearing a tall hat, an image, mayhap, of an early missionary. In one faraway place was found a totem containing a perfect likeness of Abraham Lincoln. An investigation was made and it was ascertained that Secretary Seward, on his visit to Alaska, had left behind some pictures of Lincoln, which inspired the Indian sculptor. A long line of totem poles guards the shore road, leading to a large open space where the old blockhouse was located. This site marked the scene of the last bloody conflict between the hostile Indians and the Russians. Altogether, this last Sunday was a day of worship. On his return from Sitka's National Monument Park, the president was met by Father Pontelarf of the little Greek Catholic Cathedral of St. Michael. He told the story of the valuable old icons, Russian paintings on the walls of the church, and brought forth the rare enameled goblets of gold and silver, the choicest specimens of Russian art. From a chest were taken out many golden tapestries which shone in the light. One young lady inquired, How do you keep them from tarnishing in this damp climate? Ah, but these are pure gold, declared the father in his broken English with a kindly smile. There were images and crucifixes of ivory set with gems, many of them contributed by members of the royal family in years past, as far back as the time of Peter the Great, and the collection is said to be valued at more than a half million dollars. 
As President Harding was leaving the church, the father called to him. The doors of the sanctuary were thrown wide open, something that had not occurred in many years. The father, in whispered prayer, repeated, Blessed are the good. This glimpse of the inner sanctuary was the highest honor the devoted father could bestow upon a human. All of the rich treasures shown were in sharp contrast to the simplicity of the interior of the little church, with its box stove in each corner, around which the members of the little congregation hovered before attending worship on cold winter days. These were a sturdy, hopeful folk, the physical survivors of the fittest, the adventurers of Russia and America blended. Lengthening shadows came all too fast on this, our last Alaskan day, at Sitka, the Serene. No more poetic place could have been chosen for the final scene in the president's dramatic journey through Alaska. Here, the American flag was first unfurled, and here it remained until the capital was removed in 1907. Here, in 1923, that flag was crowned with a new meaning to the people of Alaska. On the placid waters of the harbor nestled the good ship Henderson that was soon to sail away laden with happy memories of the golden days in Alaska. From the deck again and again we viewed Sitka, with its green mosques and spires, its moss-covered roofs contrasting sharply with red tile, a picture of American homes in the lights and shadows, softened in the haze of that long, lingering twilight after the sun, as if loath to leave, bade us goodbye. In this superb opalescent sunset, the ship sailed out and on, as Warren G. Harding looked for the last time upon Alaska the alluring, the land of isolation. Looked upon the somber, solitary, melancholy mountains, harboring both afterglow and shadows, forerunners of the shades of night.